So welcome to this episode of Menopause Conversations. I'm delighted to have my guest with me, Dr. Sarah Ball. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you, Amanda. It's lovely to be here and to actually meet you, meet you, well, not face to face, but meet you more yeah. properly. Finally. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We both just said before we started recording, it's funny when you come on these things because you feel like you know people anyway. Um, but, it, but it is really wonderful to, to, to know you. And um, we're going to talk about a topic that's actually gaining quite a lot of interest, particularly at this time of year, I should say, when we have more pollen, um, more tree pollen, particularly grass pollen weed pollen um, in abundance and in the context of menopause so you're probably thinking well how do those two things come together we're going to talk today um, a little bit about histamine intolerance or HIT as it's known so it's not the HIT type of thing you exercise with so um, Sarah would you like to introduce yourself a little bit of your background um, before we get chatting yeah sure so um, I'm a GP um, by by trade so I've been doing that for over 20 years in the NHS and but I've always had a uh, real interest in women's reproductive health all the way through that and then I got very interested in the menopause about five years ago so I've been working doing that in the private sector since then um, and I work for a clinic called Health and Menopause um, so we do uh, virtual and face-to-face -face consultations and of course when you're talking about the menopause although it sounds like a narrow kind of brief actually it's so wide and so vast and actually it opens up conversations about the whole of women's health um, and so you end up dealing with lots of other issues which may be partly related actually very much related or or occasionally not related to menopause but it, it, it ends up all tying together so it's very holistic care isn't it menopause which is why oh, we yeah. can bring in all these other subjects which often show themselves I think and maybe I think because of private medicine obviously we have the luxury of time and so you have very in-depth conversations with patients and therefore you can sometimes discover things that have actually been an issue for them for years they just haven't maybe ever had the time to air it or the someone joining the dots to go actually this issue you thought's nothing to do with why you're here today is actually really relevant yeah absolutely and you describe brilliantly I mean I, um, in my workplace sessions uh, when I talk about menopause I talk about menopause like an octopus yeah. in that it's got all these tentacles and you yeah. never know where they're going and and only when you sort of start at the end that you see it leads mm. back to menopause or back the other yeah. way um and and so I definitely felt like that um and I've been perimenopausal for 15 years um so when I was 36 with a two-year-old um and largely written off as a anxious first-time mother but the reality was I got a real sense that things were really changing for me and not just on the hormonal level but um you know I'm rooted in science I've got a background in science so I was always quite curious but I can remember stumbling across this thing that was called histamine intolerance and then the subtext was the hundred symptom condition ain't that the truth <laughs> Isn't that that? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I was like, oh, my God, just the hundred. Um, so what is it about histamine? Can you tell people, firstly, what histamine is and then how that yes. might interplay with menopause? Yeah, of course. So histamine is an absolutely crucial chemical that we have in our bodies. We make it in our bodies. Um, we make it in lots of different cells, but the sort of the main cell that we produce it in is called our mast cells and they're part of our immune system um so it's a very important part of our immunity and how we react to things and allergic reactions but actually it does a lot of other really important stuff as well so it's um uh, it's part of our uh, stomach acid for example so it's to do with our digestion and it's also what's called a neurotransmitter so it helps in our brain to alter our mood, um, our sort of cognition and memory. Um, and actually it does, um, histamine actually improves libido, which not many people know about. Um, so it's actually crucial to have some. Um, the What gets really important is how much you have, basically. So it's like, um, it, it, it's, it's not that much different in a way to, to water, Water obviously is absolutely crucial for life, 
but actually if you have too much water then bad things can happen like drowning for example so it's it's about histamine having um enough to do its function but not too much that it starts to become toxic um and where it gets a bit complicated is that although our body's making it all the time it makes it in different amounts depending on other conditions that are at, at the time which we can talk about and we also take histamine in as well as part of our diet in various amounts so there's lots of variables um and my uh, you know i've talked about this many times but i continue to believe it's a really useful analogy that whenever we're talking about histamine we should think about a bathtub so you've got um you know your bath has a fixed capacity depending on the size of of your your bath um and you've got your taps which are putting histamine in from the top that's the histamine that you'll you make intrinsically and then it's the histamine that you take in and then you've got a plug hole which is going to drain away your histamine um and you need more leaving or the same amount leaving as coming in. If you end up with your taps full on and the plug shut, then you're going to be in trouble. So it's only when the bath overflows that you then have what we call histamine intolerance, which is when you've got too much accumulated histamine, which then can start to cause all sorts of problems as you obviously experienced yourself Amanda. yes yes and and so this is the thing so um the things that sort of presented for me um was actually I would be always cutting labels out of clothes like okay so yeah and said so, and these are the most ridiculous things that you would you probably would never connect the dots on things like I couldn't bear to listen to people eating so sound was a really big issue for me um light as well and it was like you know what's going on here um Mm. and so exactly as you say and I would periodically come up in hives so if I would get hot a a patch would come up on my back and I'd say to my husband does that come up and it would be like a a flash of red and bobbly and raised um like uh, they were called urticaria don't they and uh you know sort of hives and it would just be for absolutely no apparent reason and one of the things I mean if you need a Rudolph impression missed any time, I'd be great because my nose, I'd have a glass of wine and my nose would go yeah. bing. And it'd be like, yeah. I mean, it was so obvious there. It was so embarrassing. And then it would extend and people would always say to me, have you got a cold? You sound really snuffy. Have you got a cold? Hmm. And I would permanently swallowing, like, like I mean, like a mucus factory. Um, yeah. It would never come down the front of my nose, always down the back. I'd be coughing in my sleep. And these are all aspects of it aren't they because like you say it's it's a it's an active immune system yeah so because we have mast cells in so many parts of our body in different concentrations you can find that you get symptoms in all sorts of different systems of the body so like you seem to have had predominantly skin ones so that can be like feeling like you've got an eczema starting for the first time or eczema flaring up that the itching the hive there's quite a good um very basic sort of test if you just run your uh fit your fingernail down the inside of your inner arm and watch the line if it comes up as a quite a red marked line quite quickly that's probably a sign that you've got too much histamine in your system um so that's just a a really intro you know just an easy kind yes. of, of test um and, and as you say flushing that's not necessarily just to do with the skin but it's more to do with the blood vessels being hyper responsive so some people get flushing some people get very edematous and they get like fluid retention some people will have like drop attacks and faint because then the blood pressure drops very quickly because the blood vessels suddenly open um mm-hmm. too wide um some people get more of the gut symptoms which could be anything from more wind indigestion um sort of heartburn diarrhea um occasionally constipation most of them would say oh i've got ibs yes um, but but actually it might not you know it there could be an underlying reason for it um there's uh some people get joint pain mm. um with it um uh, and some people, if they're still um, having periods, they would tend to have heavier and more painful periods because there's mast cells in the womb. So that can 
cause my inflammation there are mast cells in the bladder so some people get like well it's called all sorts of different things like might have like burning bladder syndrome yes. or interstitial cystitis is another name that's often given to it where it's not actually an infection but they get these flare-ups from time to time that's so um, interesting yeah and migraine is another really common yes. one um because the mast cells around the nerves um and, and this sort of um anxiety and panic attacks i've seen people with with um that related to histamine and, and this kind of insomnia and like i call it like the wired feeling that feeling yes. that you just you kind of yes. you can't switch off and you're insomniac and you've got ringing in your ears and like it's all your nerves are like on jangling kind of thing that's so true um, and that's how i knew i had covid by the way yes I knew I had COVID because my mast my cells went absolutely nuts. I said to my husband, yeah. it's like I've got an electrical charge going through my body. And yes. the night waking thing is like you wake, but it's also, I would get uh, fluttery sensations in my yes. heart, like a, like a palpitation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then it would be like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, but I'm not actually thinking about anything. But you feel so alert mm. when yeah. actually you had five minutes previously being quite fast asleep. Um, yeah. So, so we know it's important, but you're absolutely right. So can we talk about, um, so we, we know that we've got internal systems, but we've also yeah. got those external systems. And can we talk about what starts to happen possibly in midlife? Because yeah. histamine intolerance can occur outside of menopause. Yeah, it can. What and is, actually, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, so there's, some men have histamine intolerance. So it's yeah. not just defined to women, no. but women do have the vast majority of it. Yeah. And that's because of the intrinsic relationship between histamine and estrogen so in a kind of a, a very bizarre uh, I don't know who designed this probably not a woman um estrogen makes the mast cells make more histamine yes and then so in other words estrogen turns the taps on a bit more but estrogen also closes the plug hole a bit as well so that the, one of the main enzymes, there's two enzymes, one, the main one that controls getting the histamine out of our gut from anything that we've eaten or drunk, which is called DAO, estrogen actually down-regulates that a bit. So it's a bit like making your plug hole smaller than it would otherwise be. So you've got kind of two reasons then why estrogen is more likely to produce uh, east, uh, histamine accumulation. And then just to really make that situation just that little bit worse, the more histamine you've got going around your system, the more that stimulates your ovaries to make a little bit more estrogen. So you end up with literally more histamine makes more estrogen, makes more histamine, makes more. So you end up in this circle. vicious circle. So hence why if you are a, a doctor, well, dealing with anything really, but especially women's health, you need that radar for histamine issues because at times in our cycle when our estrogen is high you are a bit more likely to have effects from too much histamine so uh, we traditionally have the most estrogen in our cycle at the time of ovulation so that's halfway through your cycle normally about day 14 for the average uh, person with a cycle of you know of four weeks um and then there's also a little bit of a, a, a higher amount of estrogen relative to other hormones just before you have your period as well. So, right. but for most people, it's the ovulation time, which is the tricky one. And actually, interestingly, if you look at, um, say, asthma attacks in women mm. and you look at when they happen, actually, they are most common around ovulation. So it just shows us that the sort of allergies that we may have never thought about having any bearing to our reproductive health actually do are linked with our menstrual cycle and then there are also times in our lives when our estrogen is even higher than at other times so that's traditionally at puberty um, because our ovaries are just trying to work out what to do and so they start to spurt out lots of estrogen at some points and then hardly any at all at other points and then again, when we reach perimenopause, which is essentially reverse puberty, you still you get these massive spikes of estrogen and then no estrogen and it kind of um, yo-yos for a while. So that's why some people will say, oh, yeah, I used to get a bit of eczema, eczema or migraines um, or say rhinitis, like you said, when the mm. nose always feels snuffly when I was a teenager. But it all cleared up. 
And then, and now I'm about 40, it seems to have come back. And actually that makes total scientific sense because that's when your estrogen is the most problematic. Um, And then interestingly, when we're pregnant, our estrogen levels go, you know, phenomenally high. So you would think, oh my God, that must be a nightmare. People must get super like histamine. Yes completely overflowing and flooding the whole house and garden and village and everything (laughs) but what's really interesting from an evolutionary point of view our bodies realize that would be really damaging to a fetus yes so when we're pregnant that DAO enzyme that's going to clear histamine out of our body um, actually increases about 600 fold so that you can drain it away more easily so most people but not all that have um, histamine issues related to genetic problems with their DAO enzyme actually will feel like a million dollars in pregnancy because all their allergies seem to clear up. And then the minute they deliver and the baby's out, they feel like it's all gone back to how it was. Um, Yes. I feel that is I feel that is my situation to a T. My first 12 weeks were awful. I was in bed for the, the the pretty much most of that I was working yeah. at that time as well and I just felt awful Sarah just mm. truly awful wasn't keeping anything down and then mm. like most people I had this window and I still say I have never felt better in my entire life than the last and then, six months yeah. of my mm. of my pregnancy yeah. and yeah. and then very quickly after that it all went on the slide like massively mm. yeah. you know and like yeah. I just said to you before I had a two-year-old mm. and I was coming out in acne everything I was so irritable like mm. really and I would say for me that is the biggest negative thing about histamine for me that my irritability you know yeah. it just it just comes like that yeah and so and so what can we do then because we painted this really <laughs> yeah right doom and gloom picture Uh, yeah which it can feel like if you don't get the right supports and in fact interesting what you just said there I went and saw a respiratory consultant I had cameras up my nose I've had cameras down my throat because I had all the acid symptoms and no one sadly was connecting the dots and this respiratory consultant I just said look I every time I take my estrogen it's Mm. worse Mm. and I said I can literally time it and so I actually took him a graph. This won't yeah. surprise you, know, knowing me, that you now know me. I, I, took, I love I took, a woman with a spreadsheet. I took, yeah. I took my Excel spreadsheet and I went, right, let me show you. Mm. Literally, I timed it and my nose would bright red, always on the school run. Yeah. You know, <laughs> which is not a great look. Yummy, yeah, mummy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with the red nose. You've seen that woman with the red nose. Amazing. Um, and I would turn up and my, this nose thing went under my nose and it would be snuffy and I'd be like trying to blow my nose. I then started to tinker around when I took my estrogen. Yeah. And it's like, mm, definitely an ink there. And that's the, the, the allergies you talked about. I have like inhalers for asthma and stuff. Yeah. And it was only then that they actually did a finger prick test to measure my levels of mm. diamine oxidase, one of those pathways that you brilliantly talked about, that they said, you've got next to nothing in there. Yeah. So, so what can people do yeah. then? Yeah. Well, I think... If we just sort of rewind a little bit, I think one of the important things is it's a bit like, you know, if you um, were downstairs in your house and there was water coming through the ceiling from the bathroom above, you'd be running upstairs going, oh, my God, you know, what's going on? And you would want to try and solve the problem. So you go, well, what's, you know, is, are the taps on too strong or has someone accidentally put the plug in and forgotten about the bath or is the sewage pipe? blocked yes. or you'd, you'd be like right what's that the what's the problem that we could solve if you see what I mean um but often before people thought that they're trying to do the initial oh my god there's water everywhere get loads of towels put the towels down and soak it up and actually putting the towels down is a bit like taking an antihistamine yes. so you're trying to mop up the excess histamine but that's not going to solve the underlying problem, but it's just going to try and make you feel a little bit better in yes. the interim. So that's why antihistamines are part of, of one of the, the, the options of the treatment. But if you then think, well, what's going on here? I would say there's normally, most people fall into one of four groups, I would say. There are the genetic issues where actually you were just born with a plug hole that was, too small effectively and therefore it's easy to overload 
your bath. Um, so that, for example, may well apply to you by the sounds of it. Mm. Um, and um, I, for example, have had my genetic pathways mapped because it can be done. Unfortunately, it's not something that's available on the NHS. In fact, just even talking about histamine intolerance in the NHS is really quite unusual and normally wouldn't be recognised. And I hold my hand up and say, when I worked in the NHS, I'd never heard of it. I would have poo-pooed it as a, what is this weird thing people talk of? Um, now I know very different that it's absolutely a thing. It's just it doesn't fall into the realm of conventional medicine at the moment. Although having said that, something you alluded to earlier is important. I think that um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has completely obliterated a lot of people's mast cell function. Mm. And that's essentially what long COVID is. So long COVID for most people behaves like histamine intolerance and so I think finally there's going to be a little bit more focus on this as a, a real thing and something that actually causes an awful lot of health issues in so many people but it's just never recognized as such yeah. so um, I don't want people to get sort of overexcited about thinking oh I just go for a genetic test that's easy because it's not that's no. not that's not the case at all even if you can get testing it's on a private basis and it's Sort of what we call personalized um, genetics but that can be um, relevant to some people so there are some people that just genetically your plug's too small and therefore you know we're going to have to work with that um, then there's another group of people who are simply the whole system is fine their taps are fine their plug's fine their bar's big enough the problem is they're just putting the taps on way too strong so they're just taking in too much histamine in their diet. So there's, you know, we could talk about diet till the cow, cows come home, but essentially the headlines are alcohol's got loads and loads of it in. So, you know, I had a, a lovely lady a few years ago who was clearly having histamine intolerance and actually she was drinking a bottle of red wine every single night, um, mainly because she was trying to numb all of her various menopausal and histamine symptoms. And she was just making the problem far worse. Once I could make her see that and we took the wine completely out of the equation, she was completely fine. Solved, problem solved. We didn't need to do anything else. She was just, we just needed to turn the taps off quite a bit. Yes. Yes. Um, but there's also, um, you know, a lot of trendy foods these days and healthy sounding foods are actually the culprit. So anything that's fermented. So all your, your yogurts, your kefirs, your kombuchas, your kimchi, your sauerkraut your sourdough anything that's pickled anything in vinegar um anything that's been preserved anything that's aged like aged cheeses um you know deli type meats all of that unfortunately has got loads of histamine in it um and then there's um some really healthy sounding fruit and veg which you'd think how could that be a problem but it is so avocados spinach strawberries um aubergines and red tomatoes are the, the the worst of them unfortunately um so they can cause a problem so for example I had a lady who was had a really healthy lifestyle on the face of it seemingly good diet exercise loads you know meditated was you know otherwise had a very healthy life but she was explaining to me that at about four to five p.m every single day normally when she was driving home from the school run she would have a panic attack completely out of nowhere, didn't have a history of anxiety, seemed to be fine the rest of the time. But And I was like, this makes no sense. This has to relate to something she's ingesting during the day. And it turned out that at about 1 to 2 p.m. every day as her lunch, she was having an avocado and spinach smoothie. Oh, my gosh. So, so she was literally oh, turning the tax on loads. Yeah, exactly. Without knowing it, bless her. Yeah. And then so once we just changed what she had in her smoothie and took the history and it, it all went away. So it, it, it can work like that. So, yeah, so we've got the people that are just putting too much into the system. Um, and I think the other thing which also catches people out is that if you have leftovers, they will accumulate histamine. So you might cook a very fresh chicken breast and have it with, um, you know, some low histamine foods and that would be fine but if you make more than you need and then you save it for the next day or your lunch in a few days time it will be teeming with histamine by the time you get around to eating it so something that started off as 
no histamine issues becomes a histamine issue. Absolutely. So yeah, so there's, there's, that's the second group. That's the people who are just taking in too much and that can be managed with diet, which we can come back to. Um, the third group are those with bowel issues, mm. so gut issues. So they may be the people who have a known gut diagnosis already. So they might have, say, um, inflammatory bowel disease like uh, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or celiac disease or something like that. And so their, their gut is naturally uh, leaky because of that disease. Um, and therefore the DAO doesn't do its job very well. So the plug isn't really working because of their, their gut disease. But then you've also got the flip side of that coin, which is people who are just eating badly. And so their gut microbiome is rubbish. You know, maybe they're living on very processed foods or takeaways or that sort of thing. So they've created a bad microbiome, which then... Or they might have had loads of antibiotics, for example, because mm. that completely screws up your, your microbiome. And so their DAO isn't working either. So you can then get a bit of a chicken and egg scenario where you think, was the gut the problem? And then that caused the histamine issue. Or did they have a histamine issue, which then upset their gut? So it can work both yeah. ways. So um, so that's another, that's the third group. And the fourth group, um, and this is an ever- increasing group I would say is the people who are chronically stressed and you know aren't we all feeling a bit chronically stressed at times so if your adrenal glands have been on overdrive for months or years with you know stress about anything in life but particularly with the pandemic I think that upped a lot in people um, that also affects your histamine issues um, by making you release more histamine and it can also shrink your plug hole as well so when we say to people which we do all the time don't we as healthcare professionals oh you need to avoid stress and you know mm -hmm. chill out more and meditate one I always stand back if I ever say that because I don't want to be punched because I deserve <laughs> to be punched but it's also it's about recognizing we don't just say it for fun or for, for something to say it's completely true and scientifically true but obviously you need to back that up with with why that makes sense um and 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 also how to do it because it's easier said than done isn't it to yeah to relax absolutely yeah. can I come back yeah. on a couple of those things then please which is, do so yes. starting with the end in mind when again when I do my webinars for people to educate them about menopause I actually talk about the pregnenolone steel yeah which is the whole way that our you know we can't be recreating and running for our lives at the same time, our body's got to make a decision and it will always mm. outweigh, um, you know, dealing with stress and making cortisol yeah. because that's such an important pathway. So, yeah. you know, and I always say to people, you know, HRT is helpful. It's not a magic cure if your stress levels are off the charts you know I always yeah. talk about people like the ripples across the top of the, the pond or the undercurrents underneath yes. you know? yeah and the undercurrents underneath are largely influenced by, by our stress levels and and all of those things that you say and I definitely yeah. felt that because the more misunderstood I felt I was um and not being diagnosed for more than 10 yeah. years I was just so frustrated and I am pretty sure my stress levels with a young child as well definitely contributed to that being the perfect storm and um, so yeah. I would agree with you completely and and just on the gut thing I would say not all probiotics are helpful as well we must say no. to people that some probiotics are actually laden with histamine um, yeah. releasing bacteria so yeah um, it's really important to research that I've, I've got some brands so and um, people can look on my on my um, yeah. information but you know not all probiotics are the same. Yes, Some can be yes. adding to that problem, can't they, Sarah? Yes, yeah. Um, There's always there was always three that I used to recommend where I knew that they were uh, histamine intolerant friendly, if you yes. see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I also wanted to show this to people. This is the food compatibility list. Yeah. So I give that to all of my clients. This is the Swiss interest group histamine intolerance yes. called SIGI, uh, yes. which is quite nice. And it's, it makes grim reading, but it's helpful. But it talks about um, it's got like a color coded scheme here. Yeah. And not only does it tell you. So, for example, I had it really nicely explained to me once that we imagine strawberries. I mean, who doesn't love a strawberry? Mm -hmm. But, you know, the whole reason that that fruit is laden with histamine is, is, is its defense mechanism against yeah. slugs and snails. Yeah. 
Um, And now when I think about it, when I was breastfeeding my daughter, she always refused my breast milk when I'd been eating strawberries and tomatoes. Oh, wow. Yes, that's a good point. Yes. And that's how I knew to stop eating tomatoes. Um, And then, you know, obviously some years later, but um, also we know that some of these foods, not only are they laden with histamine, but they cause histamine inside of our bodies to be released. Yeah. So they're called histamine liberators, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But aubergine, as much as I used mm. to love an aubergine, mm. I can't eat those now because yeah. literally it's like, just wait for the fallout, like your lady at yeah. four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. So yeah. this can actually be quite helpful for people in terms of yeah, yeah. starting to think about, okay, if I'm eating things, it, and like Sarah said, you know, if you're getting a very overt reaction, great, make a note of that. But actually, little things like tummy cramps, upset tummy, feeling quite full, feeling a little bit sicky. These are all, you know, obviously it's very important to get that checked out, you know, not self-diagnosing. If that goes Mm. on for for any sort of period of time, you should get that checked out. But but especially if it's related to food. So I have found this hugely helpful, not restrictive, actually. And I did just want to add one thing in, which is you can supplement with your own DAO, which Mm -hmm. um, there are P supplements. um, from a well-known website um but you know you can supplement with dao and it can be very very good for people who are suffering with migraine or if you want to sort of eat relatively normally um and it and it's derived from legumes apparently peas so so that so that can be helpful but what other things can people take because there are cofactors aren't there and things that we can introduce into our diet which which might help do you have any that you can suggest yeah so i think just again rewinding a bit I think when people I mean histamine intolerance is a complex thing to you know obviously you know you and I just are trying to turn it into a simple idea to get your head around but it but it is really complex and a lot of people that I've sort of diagnosed with it or suggested they have it because it's not really a a, a, a black and white diagnosis it's more of a I think, I think you may it could be this, have yeah. this um and they often say to me do you know what I have always thought I've had food allergies and you know they might have even been referred on the NHS to a, a an allergy clinic they might have even sought out private allergy clinics and they always say I'm always told there's nothing really much wrong or whatever so they've just become more and more frustrated yeah um and, and that's the whole point of histamine intolerance. It, you're not allergic to one thing. It's not like having a peanut allergy or well, it's it's a cumulative thing. So if you imagine um, you go into your bathroom and the bath is nearly full. So you would because it's not overflowing, you are you may feel fine yeah. and you may have something with relatively little histamine in it. It's not perfect, but it's little. And you might actually make the bath overflow. So it could be something relatively innocuous, say like a banana, which is, it doesn't have loads of histamine in it, but it's not completely innocent either. So you might have a banana. And just because that is the thing which tips your bath over the edge that day, you would then blame the banana. And actually it probably wasn't the, but you know, it was, it was probably what you'd been having accumulating for days and weeks. So if you can think of that analogy in your head and think what I really want to be doing most of the time is keeping my bath much less full. Yes. I do want, I, I need something in the bath because otherwise I'm, you, you'd actually die without any histamine, but you want to keep it down, you know, near the bottom. So you've got room to put stuff in without overflowing it. Um, and, and that's the whole point is that people, when I suggest to people, I think they might have histamine intolerance. And they then the usual thing is, what well, can you do a test? And I'll usually say, nope. Um, I mean, you know, there are a few blood tests and genetic tests that may help to investigate to an extent, but it's not going to give you a black or white answer. Um, the best diagnostic test is actually to completely eliminate, or as much as someone can, histamine for just two to four weeks. Um, so, it, and that's really hard to do. Mm. You know, that is a big ask of someone Massive. to ask you to take histamine out of it. Yeah. So I don't do it lightly. And I will always say, I only want you to do it two to four weeks. And if you feel a lot better in that two to four weeks, one, that's your diagnostic test. But then what you do is then you're going to play the long game. And then this, this is a project because then you've got to find a way of keeping histamine reduced in your diet without 
you know becoming completely malnourished because you're not having anything at mm. all and, and often that does require working with a nutritionist or or you have to be your own sort of researcher and buy a, a good book or or get some online resources um ab- about histamine to, to work with um because it might be and some people will say oh for me it's tomatoes as long as I avoid tomatoes yes. I am fine and that's great and then another person might go oh no I'm I, I'm abs- I could eat all the tomatoes in the world it's if I have red wine that I'm yes stuffing. yes so it, it's about saying what works for someone else won't necessarily work for me I've got to do this one thing at a time so the general rule is two to four weeks of virtually no histamine and then gradually if you feel much better adding one thing back at a time yes. no more than maybe once or twice a week because otherwise if you then add three things back in and you feel awful you don't know you don't know what's caused what things. do no, you exactly that. so so diet that it doesn't matter you could even if there was a miracle you know wand for histamine intolerance in terms of a medication there is no point unless you're going to tackle your diet I'm afraid there is no agreed fix you cannot avoid the problem of of putting all the histamine in um so you can use a dao supplement you're absolutely right i i have to say i would always slightly counteract that advice with saying this is not the this is not going to fix the underlying problem no no it's just going to um, give you a bigger plug hole yes it's basically what i consider dao for and, it, and it's not cheap as well it usually no. works out about a pound a, a tablet mm, doesn't it for mm. most most products so um, and what you usually do is to take one or two DAO supplements about half an hour or an hour before a meal. You only would use it if you're going to have a meal that you know has got exactly. histamine in it. So I use it for people and say, look, if it's your birthday or you're going to like a wedding or a special birthday or something where you want to be sociable, you don't want to eat differently or, you know, you just want one glass of champagne with your fish and chips because that's your favorite meal and you haven't had it for months and months and months then plan in advance and take two supplements beforehand it essentially just means that your gut will be able to process that histamine that for that meal but it's not you know i think i wouldn't want again people thinking it's a quick fix because no 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 absolutely it's 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 part of you have to understand the complexity of it yes Yeah, and and is... I, and I'm the same. A lot of the time, I forget to take it. But actually, like yeah. you say, if I know I don't have that control over what I might be able to eat, yeah. you know, like if you go to an Italian or you're on holiday and stuff, actually, it can be really, really helpful. And, and certainly, yeah. um, you know, you know, it's about all of these things, isn't it? It's about do your homework and you know, yeah. know know what you're taking yeah. and yeah. actually get a reputable. Um, source and actually working with nutritionists can be really really helpful um I follow a number of nutritionists because I I feel actually we are what we eat largely and you know Mm -hmm. how we turn up and exercise and things like this and and even you know now I know for well if I have a square of dark chocolate which I absolutely love uh, and a glass of Prosecco I mean nothing gets better than Mm -hmm. that for me then um that's 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 dodgy waters as far as I'm yeah. concerned um yeah so you you are right um but what we're saying is it is largely an an under researched area you yeah, know hugely. we do need more research um and when we then throw in things like HRT and altering the levels of estrogen that we might be having inside of our bodies I do have a lot of women who come to me I think I said to you before who say actually I feel a lot worse now so how do I decide you know and it, and it yes. comes back to that chicken egg scenario that you were talking about one is driving the other and so on but yeah. I would like people to know it does improve oh yeah yeah the, yeah the, the it, human it, body it, is a huge capacity yeah. to, to yeah. accommodate these changes hasn't it yes and it is it, it is like a a, a medium to long term project for people, um, and people will just pick up just little things, and, and gradually, months and months and years, got, but they'll go. Now I can manage it. Now you know I've learned how to do it. And little things like, for example, this tea I'm drinking. It's it's called Rubosh tea. Yes. That is actually the least histamine containing tea that you can have. Whereas if you had a normal black tea or a green tea, actually that isn't great for histamine. So it's those little tips. That you know, you would think, wouldn't you, that a cup of tea is is relatively innocuous, but it, it's not if you're very histamine intolerant. 
Um, so people need to know what they can use and can't use. And I, I have like um, nutritionists that I've worked with before. They'd even have ideas of like, right, well, these stock cubes would be OK. Those stock cubes aren't OK. And it's those yes. little those little well well it's funny that you say that because it's it's not even in just whole foods that we think about you know when we think about food colorings when we think about preservatives these things I mean that is the biggest section in here even vitamin c I mean I I mean I don't know how I've managed to live without grapefruit I mean I absolutely Mm. love citrus but that is loaded Mm. with histamine so I have to make a call and go okay how much do I want that yeah um, but fortunately i'm on some medication and antihistamine which means i can't have grapefruit so it yeah. i've had to, i've had to get my kicks elsewhere yeah. basically um, no, that's fair enough. so 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 it, it is that but i think for a lot of people it's just the not knowing you know it's that whole yeah. well what is happening to me now you know yeah and yeah you know, i've got runny noses and all of these things but yeah. it is just this sensitive time that we're going through um but it is always worth having that conversation with your GP yeah um going and getting you know getting checked out that it ruling out that it's not other things as well you know that is very yeah. very important we don't want people self-diagnosing here but we yeah. wanted we wanted to do this so what uh, any other bit, yeah. actually there was something like quercetin isn't quercetin yes yeah so um quercetin is a what's called a mast cell stabilizer so it basically yeah. tries to I always think of mast cells as a bit like water bombs they're yeah. like, um, you know, they're very uh, fragile. And if you just kind of touch them, they'll explode and the, the histamine will come out. Um, whereas uh, if you have something like quercetin, which is a, a supplement, but it's also um, there's a lot of quercetin in um, apples, for example. Yes. That's that's where the old adage, an apple a day keeps yes. the doctor away, comes from. Um, it kind of makes the, the, the that water bomb, you know, the thickness of the balloon greater. So it's harder to pop it, basically. So that can be a useful supplement or, or take, you know, or eat an apple a day. That's, yeah. that, that would be a good thing to do. Um, the other, I mean, when I ask patients normally to, to consider doing a two to four week trial of, of very limited histamine, I will often say to them, use antihistamine yeah. as well for that two weeks. Again, they're not dealing with the underlying problem, but most of the time when I'm talking to patients initially about it, they're usually in trouble with, you know, the bath is already overflowing and therefore let's, let's, you know, cover all bases. Um, And, um, you know, all the antihistamines are available over the counter now, even so fexofenadine is generally considered one of the, the better ones. Now, there are two strengths of fexofenadine. The 120 milligram one is now available over the counter. Um, there is a 180 milligram one, which unfortunately is still only on prescription, but, you know, 120 is okay. And although the instructions on most antihistamines are to take one a day, um, and, you know, I'm not advocating doing something that's not written on the box, but basically for antihistamines, using it twice a day for this um, purpose is completely fine. And, uh, and I would often recommend that for taking one in the morning and one in the evening. Mm. I just tend to try tell people to avoid the Pyroton one yes. because that's the sedating one yes. and that, that's quite short acting. So, you know, normally something like satyrazine yes, or, that's what I or yes. yeah, and, and try different ones because again, yes. people with histamine intolerance, tend to have lots of sensitivities to all sorts of things not necessarily the active medication but something that's in the casing of it or the other ingredient so there's a lot of experimenting often happens. well actually you've reminded me of a really important point I actually did become very allergic I can no longer take non-steroidal anti-inflammatories I'm highly like reactive and allergic my throat starts tightening if I take ibuprofen I yes. also am highly allergic to um, another antibiotic. Okay. So my, yeah. my level of allergy has gone right up. So yeah. not great, like when you go to the dentist and you're wanting to have like, you know, pain relief and stuff like yeah. this. So you do have to have to think about those things. So, um, you know, sort of ex- expect the unexpected is, is what I'm saying. If you're starting yeah. to notice some of those those symptoms, it could be yeah. really helpful. Um, I, but antihistamines I, have been really, really helpful. Yeah. I think that's a really good point you make as well, that all sorts of medications can affect the size of our plug holes in Mm. effect. And you're quite right. Non-steroidals are one of the main ones that will shrink that plug hole Mm. more. But also most of the newer antidepressants, for example, 
um, other painkillers, sort of, you know, codeine related yes. painkillers, things like amitriptyline, um, you know, beta blockers, some blood pressure medications. Okay. There's a lot of them. So actually the typical thing for, that happens to patients if they've had these issues for years is they go because their joints hurt, which may be to do with histamine. They're given a painkiller, which oh, makes goodness. their histamine issue worse. So then they get really down because of it all. So then they're given an antidepressant. Oh my gosh. So then they're. Then they, yeah. Then they can't sleep. So they're given something like amitriptyline to help them to sleep and to help them. Pay. And so actually they end up, the problem's just being made continually worse by over medicating with things. So it's, you know, it is a minefield sometimes. It is. And that's, and, that's different, and that's how I felt yeah. going through it, Sarah. I really was at my wits end. And, and yeah. the final straw for me was when I saw on my notes, it said worried well. I thought, you've got no idea what I'm yeah. dealing with. Um, yeah. But um, one of the things that I also find really helpful is nasal rinsing with um, yeah. a salt solution. I find that to be so helpful because that just like yeah. gets to your sinuses. It has a good old clear out always yeah. with... Um, cooled boiled water yeah so there's no nasties in it and a sachet of salt and um, there's brands in boots that you can buy the whole yeah. vessel to you know netty pots and all of these sorts of things those yeah. can be really helpful in just getting some of that stuff out yeah. so like dropping your level a little bit um yeah. can be really really helpful but helpful. yeah you know it's wonderful all of these things I mean like you say the thing that drives the need here is that we need more research really don't we we need more yeah, research absolutely. we need more funding um and I, I think sorry no go on I was gonna say talking about the antihistamines again not everybody does get on with antihistamines because no. some people they do make them a bit drowsy or the the other ingredients might upset them but actually vitamin c is like a natural antihistamine yes. Yes. So I do remember a patient I had who she'd had rhinitis for, uh, well, forever. She had always had rhinitis. Miserable. And she, because she, I mean, she was in her mid fifties when I saw her. So, you know, she'd had it for, you know, half a century and it was just part of her. No one ever, you know, she hadn't thought any more about it. And then um, the more I spoke to her, I thought, actually, you've got, you know, this is a, a histamine issue. Um, and she was really anti kind of any sort of drugs or medications. I said, OK, well, just take some vitamin C and I want you to take it either two or three times a day because actually vitamin C doesn't stay in your system no. very long. No. Um, and literally the next time I saw her three months later, she went, that is a miracle. Like she said, for, for my whole life, I have sniffed. And she said, I can't believe it. My family can't. My friends oh. can't. I just stopped you know it's like yes. I've got a new, a new nose um which is you know I mean that again that won't happen for everyone but for some no. people that's their game changer there's another um sort of natural anti or supplement antihistamine called l-glutamine which yes, kind of works I take in, that in so that sort yeah. of if you can explain to people what does the, what does that do in the in the whole process again it's complicated in all the genetic kind of pathways but it, it just it acts like vitamin c and helps to um calm down the the dao um and calm down the mast cells um yeah. and just yeah, bring everything calm. bring it's, everything yes. down and there's so yes. many things as well because what i decided to do was to deal with the fact that i had this probably leaky gut i mean terrible yes. phrase isn't it yes um, it is. so so i was taking lots of things to sort of shore that up so that you don't yeah. get nasties being reabsorbed back into your bloodstream and so stress as we know you know like so like sarah was saying i got microbiome so I think it's a lot of these things, but actually start small because then you know what's having yeah. the positive impact. So don't go looking yeah. to change everything all at once. But if, if people did really change one thing, it, it is about the stress in our lives. It's such a negative yeah. contributor to, to, to so many things. But um, yeah. I suppose the message here is actually it, it is a thing. If you do start to notice you becoming more allergic to anything, really, but particularly yeah. during perimenopause, menopause, yeah. postmenopause, even, then, then that could be really helpful. One thing I did just want to add in, and this is something yeah. certainly to do with COVID, um, you know, I knew I was really on tricky ground after my COVID vaccinations, actually, yeah. and really heavy bleeding, like really clotty. And that's one of the things that a lot of women come to me that, you know, because they're, even though their progesterone level is lower relative, their estrogen yeah. is much higher that, you know, really like clotty, very enriched sort yeah. of menstrual blood coming down, you know, so any sort of 
breakthrough bleeding please get that checked out it's really really important but we do know like Sarah said is there's emerging research and findings looking at that relationship and that interplay between COVID and and how it interacts but if anyone does react badly to their COVID vaccination then you yellow card report that you know because that's really helpful so so how can we summarize all of this Sarah then in terms of you know what what, what's the take home for people because people love a take home what's the take they do love a take home I guess there's I suppose one issue is there is this thing, as we've explained, called histamine intolerance, which may be affecting all sorts of people. So people with multiple unexplained health issues always think something like histamine intolerance, whether you're, you know, man, woman, you know, a teenager, you know, a middle age, whatever. Um, The fact that, um, you know, your work and my work is predominantly about menopause, I guess means remembering that hormones have a big influence on this for us females and as you said so many people when I first see them they're coming because of their menopause symptoms and we're having a conversation about the options for their menopause which will include HRT as a possible option for people so people go well hang on a minute she's just told me how estrogen is going to make the whole problem worse why then would I kind of you know then what do I do and I suppose there's two issues one is the symptoms of menopause almost mirror the symptoms of histamine intolerance and there's a a vast overlap so one is for us healthcare professionals and patients to try and have that radar on of measuring it with your cycle if you're in perimenopause you know when do I feel worse what symptoms are happening at what time in the cycle because that will make my job an awful lot easier to try and play detective in all of this but also to recognize for example that say natural progesterone or the micronized progesterone that we tend to favor in hrt at the moment it does act as a counterbalance to estrogen Mm. so it will open the plug hole a bit so there's some patients where i've just given them some progesterone and actually that's really made them feel an awful lot better i've had a few patients really respond to that where they were having they felt they developed sort of middle-aged asthma or they were getting out of puff a lot more than they used to when they were out running or doing exercise and I just give them some progesterone and actually it all calms down. That's that, wow. that, that's great. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that to think about, but there were also, even if you're histamine intolerant and we can get that under control, at some point you are going to get to the point where you are properly menopausal and actually your estrogen levels now have gone permanently low and you may want to be dealing with that because now the menopause it's almost like you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Yes. You can get the histamine much better, which probably means the menopause is going to now be your main problem, or it's going to be the other way around. And but obviously we want a nice a nice balance. Um, so again, what I say to my ladies is, let's talk about that bathtub again. I want to get a load of that water out of your bathtub, so I've got lots of room to play with, because then I could give you a little bit of HRT which and you've got plenty of room for the HRT yes so a lot of the ladies have to start on the tiniest amount because they're still dealing with their histamine issues and getting into good habits and then maybe six months a year I've got some patients now a few years down the line where they're tolerating really normal amounts of HRT because they've got their diet and their yes. exercise and relaxation and gut health and all sorted so it is it's learning that you you don't have to have one without the other we no. they can coexist as long as you're mindful of, of the relationship yeah with both. absolutely um and um yeah and obviously this you know this is kind of you know it's really complicated and there's lots of things to think about but um if you do go on our health in menopause website um i have written a fairly comprehensive leaflet about it with trying to explain all this again because i know it's, it's kind yeah. of information overload a bit well and, I think, as you said, you know, we, we always have to say in these things for obvious reasons, you know, you must check with this, this is your GP and that's completely right. But you'd be lucky if your GP's heard of it. Well, um, this is, and th- this is it. And yes. this is why I wanted to do and this so, with you. Yeah, empower yeah. yourself a bit like exactly for the menopause. You know, if you've, you know, say read a leaf like ours, gone on to your resources, had a look at them. If you've got a good idea of what's going on yourself. You've tracked, you know, a diary. You've seen any relationships and what happens with what. And then you've gone along and said, uh, you know, and of course there are changes you can make. You'll say, you know, you can take mm. some vitamin C. You can try some anti-histamines. Uh, you can look at the diet leaflets. But, you know, and yes, you should always have 
some more help, but just be mindful that the help's very variable. And sometimes actually a, a clued up nutritionist is your best friend in this situation. Um, so to always ask before you make an appointment with a nutritionist to say, do you deal with histamine intolerance? Because most do now, but yes. there are still some that good, don't. Good so, shout out, check. because actually yeah. what you don't want is to be encouraged to take something that's just going to make it e even yeah. worse. So, so yeah. no, I, I agree with all of that, Sarah. And, um, you know, I'm really happy, actually, because I've sort of became really knowledgeable about something that uh, really fascinated me. And I know yeah. I was probably seen as probably quite a difficult case maybe a decade yeah. ago in terms of managing menopause yeah. but I'm really glad I sort of researched the the, the ins and outs of it because yeah. it really is that hundred symptom condition which is closely related yeah. with peri perimenopause but yeah. but now thank you so much for your time I could talk to you for ages but um so how can Likewise. people be more in touch with you and follow you um because you do write brilliant your posts on Instagram are so brilliant by the way that's a other old right another whole level of skill that you've got but where can where can people find you if they want to know more you're, you're, you're very kind I think it's um it's uh, my Instagram is almost like an uh, uh I almost feel naked on Instagram it's like it's like a naked look at the inner weirdness of my brain <laughs> I love do you know who you remind me of you remind me of um Zoe Hodson Dr. Oh, Zoe, yeah. <laughs> she's always talking about her three-legged mil milking stool and I remembered yeah. seeing you on a webinar and I thought I love that lady she talks my language it's absolutely yeah. so I've been trying to get in touch with you for ages so I'm so glad we have but but yeah so how can people be in so, no more about yeah, so, you? so I'm on Instagram at um at Dr. Sarah Molly Ball that's D-R Sarah Molly with a Y ball um and we've also got an Instagram account for the clinic which is at health underscore in underscore menopause um and the health of menopause is also on facebook and linkedin um so yeah www.healthinmenopause.co.uk and there's um in the resource section there's a leaflet about histamine intolerance which should wonderful be helpful one and 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 it is because i have read some of uh, sarah's information and I found it to be so comforting, so helpful, so um, just really uh, directional as well. Like, you mm. know, in terms of, you know, what you can do next, you know. And yes, I think that's yes. what a lot of us want. We want to just take a, reclaim a bit of our power back that we feel we've lost. Mm. Um, yeah. So that is wonderful. So for now, Sarah, thank you so much for your time so generously. Um, I'd love to come back and do another one of these with you at some stage. But for now, Sarah, sure. thank you. Thank you.